Hello, Dodgeland families. You are currently connected to the annual Dodgeland Sports Meeting that all student athletes and parents and guardians are required to attend for participation in any sports during the upcoming school year. My name is Marsha Moda, and I am the Dodgeland Middle School High School Associate Principal and also the District Athletic Director. This presentation has been pre-recorded and is being provided virtually to all Dodgeland families in response to the COVID pandemic since we cannot provide families this face-to-face -face meeting at school and also maintain safe social distancing for everyone. This presentation will provide student athletes and their parents with the information related to participation in sports as a Dodgeland student during the 2020-2021 school year. I will be sharing information about concussions paired with a short video. Concussion education is required by Wisconsin state law, and it requires a yearly concussion education for every athlete and their parents. This presentation will also review the Dodgeland Athletic Code and the board approved expectations for all student athletes. I encourage you to write down any questions that arise during this presentation and email them to me. I will then share questions and answers with everyone through a link on our Dodgeland Athletic webpage titled Frequently Asked Questions. The Dodgeland School District utilizes PowerSchool as our student information system. PowerSchool is used to enroll students maintain all student and parent information, stores attendance and academic grades, and is linked to the School Messenger, which is another technology program that delivers important information and updates to all of our district families. It is imperative that parents review their student and parent information multiple times throughout the year to ensure that all data is correct and up to date. Use your parent login information to access your child's PowerSchool information, and that login is the same as in previous years. If you cannot remember your login information, please call the school and Mrs. Benz at extension 1010 will gladly assist you. If you did not receive a text and an email message reminding you of tonight's meeting, then your phone information in PowerSchool is likely incorrect. We will be sending out e-registration information in August along with school updates throughout the year. Your careful review of all PowerSchool information will help ensure accurate and timely receipt of electronic school updates. Our school website continues to be updated so as to provide everyone access to a wide array of information, including athletics and their schedules. All documents and forms that I will talk about tonight have links on the website for quick access. All school-based events are also listed and we utilize a calendar. What I have shown on the screen is a uh, picture of our school district website. If you go to the schools tab and click either high school or middle school, it will then take you to that specific school's site. I've selected high school, so as you see below, Dodgeland High School is listed. In order to get to the athletic information, click on the uh, extracurriculars tab and athletics comes up as a choice and if you select that, it will take you to our athletic web page. This is a picture of all the links for the forms and documents that are provided on the athletic page. These are going to appear underneath an athletic update and information. So if you just scroll down, each one of these links are available to you. They are also available in Spanish form. Not every document, but numerous documents are available for families in that format. If you would like to see a specific sports calendar, then on the athletic page in the upper left-hand corner is this purple box. 
select which sports you want. For this example, I've selected football. And what we'll pull up next is a picture of last year's team and underneath it being the calendar. The calendar that shows will be reflective of the date, to the date that you're actually logging in and viewing it. So I've gone and asked for this month of September by choosing from the options here. And I selected to look at the September 25th game. And when you click an event, another little helpful box will appear. It's providing you game time and also the location of that game. It's located at Dodgeland High School, which we all know where our high school is located. If it was an away game instead, then if you were to click on this link, it would also pull you up to MapQuest and give you directions to that school. So again, take advantage of these helpful features that are embedded within this. Please be aware that schedules are being updated over the next weeks in response to the WIAA decision to adjust our fall sports season start dates. Thank you for your patience as all conferences and schools work together through this rescheduling process. Dodgeland is a member of the WIAA, which is the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association. This organization governs school-based athletics in Wisconsin. Dodgeland is also a member of the Trailways Conference within the WIAA. The Trailways Conference consists of 24 schools ranging in size and distance in southeastern Wisconsin. Schools are assigned divisions within our conference for sports, and those divisions are based on geographic locations. Also, schools within our conference sponsor numerous co-op programs with other schools, so please be aware that certain schools are going to be the host schools for these co-op programs. Football conferences were realigned re across the entire state last winter, and our football program is now a member of the Eastern Suburban Conference. This realignment was done to group schools with opponents of similar high school enrollment. Our new Eastern Suburban Football Conference consists of Cambridge, Clinton, Dodgeland, Marcus Ann, Marshall, Palmyra Eagle, Partyville, and Waterloo. This year, we did have non-conference games scheduled against Trailways opponents Deerfield and Cambria Friesland, but since weeks one and two are not going to be played, we will be looking at getting games rescheduled with these other Trailways opponents for the 2021 school year. Our boys and girls soccer programs are members of different conferences since the Trailways Conference does not have soccer-based programs. Our boys team competes in the Capital Conference and the girls compete in the Flyaway Conference. For middle school athletics, our athletic programs compete in two different conferences and it depends on which sport. Wrestling and track, so our spring sports compete in the Monashaw Conference while our other fall and winter sports compete in the Trailways Conference. Regardless of the conferences our teams and athletes compete in, Dodgeland follows all WIAA rules and procedures. Each year, the WIAA distributes an eligibility bulletin, which I then distribute to all families. It is one of the links on our athletic website. This four-page document identifies all eligibility requirements for participation in athletics. Parents must acknowledge they've received access to this document on the two-page signature page. And again, a link to this signature document is provided on our athletic page, and I'll be talking about those in uh, a little bit further in our meeting. The WIAA rules overlap with our Dodgeland Athletic Handbook and our Code of Conduct. The WIAA expects all parents and community members to follow the chain of communication, which begins first with the district's athletic director. So if you have a question, if you have a concern, please contact me first. If you do make a call to the WIAA, 
they will directly back direct you back to me. So again, please just initially address those questions with me. Since 2012, a Wisconsin law requires all student athletes and their parents to receive concussion education prior to the start of any practice. Concussions are a serious injury to the brain, with each person responding differently to these impact-based injuries. I have a video for you to watch, and it will provide you a thorough explanation of concussions, identify the common warning signs, and also explain the treatment needed to recover from a concussion. This is a concussion. A concussion is a type of brain injury. You can't see it. You may not have a bump, a bruise, or even a scratch on your head. All that has to happen for you to get a concussion is for your brain to move around inside your skull. You don't even have to get hit on the head. A jolt or hard slam to your body can make your brain bounce back and forth against the inside of your skull. Getting a concussion doesn't always mean you get knocked out. Less than 1 in 10 people who get a concussion ever lose consciousness. And you can get a concussion in any sport or physical activity, even skateboarding, biking, or snowboarding. The number of sports and recreation concussions every year could be as high as 3.8 million. That's more than the total number of hairs on every monkey ever shot into space in the last 50 years. So what do you do if you feel like you've got a concussion? You could have symptoms like confusion, headache, dizziness, nausea, fatigue, or a general foggy feeling, like your brain has a bad Wi-Fi connection. It's important to report it to your coach, your athletic trainer, your parents, or even a teammate right away. Otherwise, you may end up like Mike. Mike played football. Mike was the team's star player. But after he got a concussion, he continued to play as if he was okay. Bad idea. Since then, things got kind of funny. He thought he was fine, but Mike started having headaches and had a hard time doing the things he used to do, like playing video games. Mike should have told his coach, athletic trainer, or parent and got himself out of the game right away. If you think you may have had a concussion, it's important to see a doctor or a medical professional with experience in sports concussion and not return to activities until they say it's okay. Your brain needs to rest in order to heal. If you don't rest, you could wind up like Jessica. Jessica was an all-star softball player, straight A's, busy social life. In her last game, Jessica slid head first into home plate, and her coach took her out of the game because she thought she got a concussion. But she didn't make the right decisions after the game. She didn't get checked out by a healthcare professional, tell her parents about her symptoms, or take the time to rest her mind and her body. Pretty soon, things got weird for her, too. Her social life suffered, and she started to forget things, like her date with her boyfriend. So if you don't recognize a concussion, report the symptoms, and take the time to rest, you could miss out on a lot in school, in sports, and in your social life. Concussions can make you moody, too. You might get angry, cry, or act just plain weird for no reason. And you may not even enjoy doing the things you used to like doing. Take the time to rest up completely after a concussion. That may mean no driving, TV, internet, texting, or video games. It's not fun, but it will get you better faster. So, if you think you might have a concussion, remember to... 1. Recognize. Know the symptoms and signs of concussion for yourself and your teammates. 2. Report. Tell your coach, athletic trainer, or parents about your symptoms. Get out of the game. Staying in could make it worse for you and your team. And 3. Rest. That means taking time off from sports, your usual activities, and maybe even schoolwork until your doctor or other medical professional says it's okay. But don't worry. Your teammates will step up while you're out, and your teachers can help you. Check out the website for more info on how to get over a concussion and get back in the game.
to review some of the information that you have seen in the concussion video. Again, concussions do not result in the same symptoms for everyone. So that is why it's important for everyone, the student athletes, the teammates, the coaches, the parents, all of us to know the warning signs. And if we see this in an individual, including ourselves, then we need to report this to a coach, to a licensed athletic trainer, to a parent. Students then also come to me at school and let me know, especially if it's later in the uh, night after a game has concluded or if it's the next day at school and they're not feeling well. Communicating how they're feeling is so important. Athletes, if you see a teammate not feeling well or they identify any concussion symptoms, tell your coach, tell a teacher, tell an adult right away so that help an assessment can be done. Speaking of assessments, concussions can only be confirmed with a doctor's assessment. An athletic trainer can conduct an initial assessment for a concussion, and when the data in can indicates that a concussion has probably occurred, they will refer the athlete to see their doctor. Parents, you can expect a phone call from an athletic trainer if they feel that it warrants a trip to your doctor to check for concussions. Untreated concussions can result in serious continued impairment and even permanent damage. The three steps that the video talked about, recognize the warning signs, report it to a coach, to a trainer, to a parent, and then rest to allow for recovery these are the critical steps for everyone's recovery from a concussion. This is, again, never a secret to keep to yourself. We follow a five-day protocol of progressive physical activity when a student athlete's symptoms have subsided. That means their headaches, their blurred vision, any of those other common symptoms have now subsided and the trainer is going to take them through five continuous days of activity. Day one is going to be shorter with 10 to 15 minutes of low level activity. If the athlete does not experience any return of symptoms during the activity or after, then day two will increase in time, 15 to 20 minutes with a little bit of an intensity increase. Day three, a little bit longer, a little bit more intensity, the same with day four and day five. When an athlete is able to successfully go through the five-day protocol, no return of symptoms, no return of any other complications, then the athletic director will be directing the athlete and the parents to take them back to their doctor to get final clearance for a return to full participation. A doctor's clearance is required to be returning to full participation following a concussion. When concussions happen, often there's the need to modify our academics and sometimes even the school day for an athlete. The first thing is screen time. Screen time on cell phones, on video games, TV, and on iPads. We need to limit and sometimes even remove that from what a student is experiencing because that can be very demanding and taxing on the brain and inhibiting the recovery time. So if at school, if it's needed, we totally eliminate the iPad for them or we reduce it and make minimal time that's allowed. We then redo a schedule so that if they're currently enrolled in FIAD, they're not actively participating in physical education. Also classes that might have a higher level of noise and the sensitivity to noise, such as a music class, or also some of our tech ed and hands-on classes in those areas, we might need to modify a student's schedule for a short period of time. At school, if they're still experiencing light sensitivity, we've allowed students to wear sunglasses to minimize that impact. And I can contact all the teachers and our pupil service team, and we work together to help the student as they're recovering from a concussion. We modify assignments. We eliminate assignments if need be. Sometimes just listening in class is enough. 
and then we delay assessments and tests until that student is able and ready to resume an academic load. Again, what a student's timeline is going to be from recovery is very individual. Uh, we can't compare them to a previous concussion or to another student athlete's. So again, be patient with yourself to allow yourself to go through this concussion recovery. One piece that we do for athletes in high school is something called impact testing. We do an impact test, which is a computerized based assessment, and it measures a student's cognitive response. These tests provide a baseline for the athletic trainer and a doctor if they request to see those results to compare if a concussion has occurred. This assessment takes about 45 minutes long. The test is valid for two years, so not every athlete has to do this each year. We do it on an alternate year basis. So incoming freshmen to the high school this year and likely returning juniors to athletics or any student new to Dodgeland or to our athletic activities must complete this assessment prior to the start of our practices. We have scheduled three dates and six total sessions for this. This is for high school students again only. We will have 10 students at a time in high school classroom 303 completing this. Face coverings are required since again, we're in a classroom setting. We wanna make sure that we're keeping everyone safe. We will also provide a sign up link and send that to families via school messenger. We'll post it on our website so that students can sign up for the times. Tuesday, August 18th and Thursday, August 20th are the exact same times, three to four, and then four to five, pick one of those times. Or if Wednesday, August 19th works better in your schedule, the times are slightly different, 4.30 to 5.30 and 5.30 to 6.30. The next portion of this pre-recorded meeting will be covering and addressing the topics within the Dodgeland Athletic Code. Our athletic handbook is a board approved document that identifies the requirements and expectations for participation in athletics. This handbook was created by a group consisting of a variety of people, school administration, coaches, teachers, students, parents, and also community members. Parents and athletes are expected to read and know the contents of this handbook since this meeting will not address every element and every item contained within this handbook. I am gonna to be touching on the key points though, just like I do each year at our face-to-face -face meeting. Participation in athletics creates the possibility for injury. Anything that we are per virtually doing in life creates a possibility for injury. However, the nature of athletics and the competitiveness and the close proximity of individuals during competition, it just lends itself to a greater likelihood that an injury may occur. Parents must acknowledge this by uh, giving their consent for their student athlete to participate in any sport. This is actually the very first signature that's required on our documents and it is titled the Acknowledgement of Risk. Regarding eligibility for participation in Dodgeland sports, it starts first with all of the required documents that must contain the necessary signatures and also be submitted and checked off in our offices prior to any athlete participating in practices. Incomplete forms result in an athlete having to sit and watch the practice instead of being able to be active. So it's important that parents and athletes both share in the task of double checking all documents to make sure all information is completed and all signatures have been provided. Let's take a look at some of the forms that need to be completed since we are not having the face-to-face -face meeting to be able to look at these. Right. This is a copy of a new physical form. The form that is on our website also contains a three-page medical history that you complete and provide this to your doctor. This is the final page, and if you look at the top, it is the clearance form. 
this is the absolute must document that we have to have. Parents, you can fill out this top portion. This middle portion is gonna be completed by the doctor. Please make sure that there is a date of the evaluation that's included. There's a lot of lines on this document and sometimes that's overlooked. This portion right here before we get to the signature is what parents need to complete. This is your parents' place of, the parents' place of employment, their uh, family physician. This is your medical insurance information. And at the very bottom, it is crucial that we have a parent signature and also a date. If your child did not need a new physical this year, instead they had one last year, and this is their second year, they're able to use an alternate year card. So this is what that document looks like. Again, put the physical date in the upper left. This was recorded on the mailing insert that you should have received uh, earlier in July. And again, complete all the information, including all the medical coverage information. We may have some families that this was the summer for them to get a new physical for their student athlete, but the doctor's offices haven't been able to uh, handle all of those requests due to the COVID situation. The WIAA has granted a short-term resolution to this, and this document is a WIAA physical extension form link is available within our athletic documents. This is just a portion of a one-page document that you need to complete, and this document would allow your child to start practice with their teammates, and the parent still needs to schedule a new physical yet this fall or as soon as possible with their physician. The next Two sheets are ones that I've always Xeroxed in purple. So I've referred to them year after year as the purple two-sided document. This is the top half portion of page one. That is the parent's acknowledgement of risk and the bottom portion is the parent and student athlete acknowledging the existence and requirements within our athletic code. This page would be the back side of that two-page document. The top half is verifying about the concussion education signature locations for both the parents and student athlete. And the bottom portion is the acknowledgement that you have received a copy, or in this case, you have been given access to review the WIAA eligibility form. That WIAA eligibility form, the first top of the page looks like this, and at the bottom of the fourth page, that's where parents had to sign. You do not need to do that on this document. Just simply complete the other signatures on those first two pages that I had just shown you. We'll back up to this emergency information and consent form. Again, this is a one-page document that parents need to complete. This is used in the event of a injury or an emergency medical situation. Copies go directly to a hospital or in the ambulance if necessary, and we retain additional copies at school uh, so that we can always be in contact with parents should they not be in attendance at an away game. Some additional documents that might pertain to your child, but may not, is this is a prescription medication form. If your child needs to take a prescription medication at school or they are on an antibiotic for an ear infection and it requires that they need to be taking it around supper time, but the bus has all, is gonna be leaving during that time, we need to have a prescription form for them to be taking that medication. This medication form is a self-carry medication form, and this would be for an individual like someone who may have asthma that they need to carry an inhaler with them. We need them to have that with them at all times during practices and games, and this is the top half of that document that would be completed uh, regarding uh, the self-carry medications. Other components for eligibility is that we do have participation fees for athletes in grades six through 12. There is $20 cost per sport or a maximum cap of $50 per athlete for the year. Parents, if you are writing a check, 
please in the memo put your student's name and that it's an athletic fee. If you are putting cash, please put it in an envelope and then write all of that information on the front of the envelope and seal it, even staple it to any of the permission forms that you're sending along with it. We want to make sure that all of this is arriving accurately and getting uh, correctly documented within our offices. Code violations. It is possible that a student had uh, made behaviors and decisions that resulted in a code violation in a previous school year. All of those code violations must be 100% served and completed in order to make them eligible to start participation in practices for the new season. And finally, we have academic and grade expectations. There are no new changes this year. There is an academic requirement that includes passing quarter, semester, and midterm grades for determining our athletic eligibility. Their first priority is a student. Their second is then being an athlete. And if we are at school regularly and using our time well and completing our work, this, this should not become a problem. There is from time to time an incomplete grade that is registered. Maybe a student was out for a period of time due to an extended illness and it resulted in an incomplete grade. That student with an incomplete grade is ineligible for contest participation until that incomplete grade is submitted by that teacher into the office and it is now updated as a completed grade. An athlete can still practice with an incomplete grade. They are just ineligible for contest participation. If there are any failing grades, one or more, all right, then we have some steps that need to be followed. Previously with fall sports, it was 21 consecutive days beginning with the earliest competition date. With the pandemic situation that occurred last spring, and fourth quarter grades being um, either passing or did not participate, all students are eligible to start uh, clear without any academic uh, uh, withholding this fall for our fall sports. Winter and spring sports, there's a 15 day period of ineligibility that follows the day that I am checking grades uh, for at the end of a quarter and a semester. We also do midterm grade checks, and those grade checks are important so that parents are also uh, able to be following and know uh, if their child is struggling in any particular class. If there is a midterm failing grade in one or more class, it results in a five-day suspension from competition, but again, they're allowed to practice. So, like the end of a quarter or semester if there's a failing grade, it's 15 days of ineligibility. And at the end of midterm grade checks, it can result in a five-day competition suspension. Regarding these periods of ineligibility, whether it's a five or a 15 day, we have a student responsibility here. We want to help them with using their days well, with tracking their assignments, and also fostering good communication between them and their teacher. So any student who has a period of ineligibility are going to be given a grade slip, and they need to take that to their teachers, get signatures with grades listed, and they return that back to me. If a student is on a five-day ineligibility for a midterm failing grade check, if they bring that first sheet back to me and they have all passing grades, they could become eligible for competition then again after those five days. If they come back to me with any failing grades listed, their ineligibility continues for another five school days and then again, they are going to be continuing a weekly grade check with this grade document taking it to their teachers. Once a student has regained their academic eligibility for competition, we haven't just completely cleared them. They are able to compete, but now we're also following up with three total weeks of grade checks for this student. 
Research shows it takes at least 21 days for us to retrain ourselves and reestablish good positive habits. So three weeks is 21 days. So that's why this grade check with taking this grade document to their teachers would continue for three consecutive weeks. If they have three consecutive weeks with all passing grades, then they no longer have to do the daily grade checks. However, if there's a failing grade at any point during those three weeks that is written and documented by a teacher, that student athlete becomes ineligible for competition for those five days and they restart this whole eligibility process again. We are really trying to help our students be successful in the classroom and taking care of their academic responsibilities. And we, we appreciate the parents' help and support with this matter as well. Regarding eligibility linked to behavior, the code of conduct violations do impact competition eligibility. And the behavior expectations fall within the riding a bus, falls within any of our time here on campus and also within classes. So if there is behavior that warrants a removal from class or being sent down to the office, it is highly likely that there will be a competition ineligibility for at least one game for that. So make good, responsible, respectful choices as students. School attendance is also another uh, eligibility expectation for all Dodgeland student athletes. Students must be present in their school and into their assigned classes by the start of second hour, which is 836. If they are not present in the classes by that time, then they are not eligible to practice or compete on that given day. There are some circumstances, however, if communicated in advance to myself as athletic director and our office, that we can be um, making exemptions to this. Except examples would be is if a student athlete has a professional appointment, such as a medical or dental appointment, that would impact their school arrival by the start of second hour. We just need an advance email and communication from the parent so that we know that they are arriving late and they should also be arriving with a medical or dental excuse from that healthcare provider as verification of that appointment. There's also some other unique family circumstances that might occur throughout the year that again, communication is important. Examples for those could be a family emergency, a family funeral, or as juniors and seniors are doing college visits, if they are going to uh, be visiting a particular university or college, then communicating this information to myself and our office in advance, we can make these absences excused and there would not be an impact on eligibility for practices or competition on that date. This is a sample of what our weekly grade check sheet looks like. Again, it is a document that the students fill out the class and the teacher's name. So now the teacher needs to just jot and write down their current percentage and grade, identify if there's missing assignments or behavior concerns, and then the teacher initials that. Regarding transportation, Dodgeland transports all of our teams, athletes, and the uh, coaches to our e away events. We also provide transportation home. If a parent travels to an away game and they would like to drive their own child home, that is permitted with the following guidelines. The coaches carry a binder with them which contains copies of the travel release form. Parents need to complete that travel release form, a new one for each and every event, and then make sure that the coach is given that. There also has to be a face-to-face -face exchange with the coach at the away events. We need to know for sure that that athlete is going home with the parent, right? 
There are also times when possibly an alternative transportation home needs to be arranged because a parent couldn't be going to that away game. It may be that an aunt, uncle, a grandparent uh, is going to the game or the parent has asked if their child could ride home with the parents of another teammate, all right? As long as I am provided advance written notice, which includes the same transportation waiver completed and written at the top or the bottom, the reason for this, and it's submitted to me prior to that uh, day of that event, then I can approve that based on looking at the information that's provided. There are days where I might be gone because I'm at some type of workshop. I may have another previous meeting that's out of the district, or maybe there is personal illness or a family situation. This is why I do not wait till the day of an away event to provide this advance written request to me. Please do it in advance, the sooner the better, so that we can avoid any of those types of conflicts that happen. On pages six and seven, it talks about violations. Violations within our Dodgeland Athletic Handbook are identified by classes. A class one violation is a significant violation because it's involving some type of use, possession, um, giving, selling of a chemical or drug. A class two violation is a violation that is linked to the code of conduct and behaviors. So that could be physical behaviors, it could be the choice of words, it could be expressing profanity. There are a lot of different code of conduct examples that fit within this class too. So I'm asking that parents and athletes that you sit down and look at those types of violations because there's one uh, that cites about academic integrity and not submitting work that is your own or plagiarism. I know the English department talks at great lengths about plagiarism and how to cite work and making sure it's authentically yours. There's also the importance to understand that in number four, it talks broadly about displaying conduct that is out of the school and not representative of the ideals uh, of what either the Dodson School District or the WIAA uphold. So again, make good choices regarding how you are representing your yourself both in words and actions, and this should not become a problem. There is also, this was added last year, uh, letter C on page eight regarding criminal behavior. That means if there is a criminal investigation that is currently taking place and or proceedings that are being uh, scheduled, any types of court hearings and so on, a student athlete is suspended from competition during the entire time of that investigation and proceedings. On pages seven uh, through eight, it talks about a due process for violations. There are timelines that are linked to this. So parents and athletes, please read this over. A due process uh, is allowed that in the event an athlete or a parent disagrees with a penalty that is assigned to a student for behaviors or actions, they do have a specific process to go through to appeal that, and that's what that due process is explaining. On page nine, we also have a self-referral clause within our athletic code. That means that if we have any student athlete who realizes that they have some type of chemical dependency or use of chemicals that they need help and assistance with changing their choices and behaviors, that they can come to a coach, to a teacher, to myself as athletic director, and do a self-referral seeking help and assistance. Our pupil services team would also then be assisting with this to align some outside counseling and other agencies to help the student deal with this. Parents would also be contacted so that they're aware of this as well. The self-referral is a clause that is meant 
for a student to help themselves, but I want to be clear that it is a clause that can't be used um, suddenly if uh, something should happen. An example is over the weekend, there is some type of party that is uh, going on and law enforcement has uh, been on scene at that. So people are aware that the party has been busted, that there could be citations and things that are occurring, and suddenly the next morning a student comes in and wants to use self-referral uh, for an alcohol or other chemical type of concern. Once that investigation and once that has taken place, place regarding law enforcement intervention and again these things come quickly to my attention self-referral is no longer applicable in this situation on pages 10 and 11 it identifies what are the penalties for the code violation the uh, violations do carry over from year to year until uh, the outcomes have been served and completed. Class two has two types of uh, penalties. They have an in-season and an out-of-season uh, because different things can be occurring at different times during the athlete's uh, school year and the athletic code is in place for 365 days, seven days out of the week, 24 hours a day. So once you have signed on for that athletic code, those expectations are in place for you each day. The handbook also talks about coaches penalties. Each of the coaches create a handbook for their program, and many times these expectations are discussed and talked uh, with parents and athletes at our meetings prior to the start of seasons. This fall, the coaches will be electronically sending out their program expectations, so it's important that parents and athletes read those over together because usually there, excuse me, is a commitment page that needs to be signed and returned to the coach. It is possible that a coach may impose a greater penalty than what exists in the code. And again, these expectations need to be clearly outlined in each of the sport handbooks. Another aspect about our athletic handbook is connected to class two violations. Let's say for some reason a student ends up in some type of verbal or physical altercation and a disagreement with another student and it results in a fight, and each student ends up with some level of suspension, which is also a code of conduct violation. If that student athlete goes through the entire next year, 365 days with no repeat of any class two type of violation, then their record is cleared. This only applies to class two violations. It does not apply to class one violations, which include the use, possession, sale of alcohol, tobacco, or any other substance, and also look-alike substances as well. On pages 12, it talks about the criteria for earning awards. Awards are distributed at the high school level, both JV and varsity levels. So again, I refer the parents and athletes to take a look at that. And also a note regarding awards, an athlete must complete their season in good standing in order to receive any of their end of season awards. Should they become suspended from a competition and if it ends up being the last game of the season, whether that be a regular season or they are in a uh, scheduled to be in a tournament game and they are suspended from that and the team does not go on, then they did not finish their season in good standing and they would be forfeiting any of their awards from that season. Pages 13 through 15 talk about expectations for everyone. And 
that is very encompassing. It starts with me, it includes our coaches, it includes our office, it includes the communication between coaches and student athletes, student athletes uh, to the office, and again, uh, with our parents as well. Communication is what's going to help us navigate many challenges that occur throughout the year, um, and we just want to be really proactive in emphasizing that. We will continue to run our daily late bus at 510. Student athletes need to be signing up for this. We are still working on the process and procedure for this, and students need to understand that riding this bus is a privilege, and that if there are behaviors on that bus that are uh, affecting a safe delivery of everyone home, uh, then they could have that privilege removed. Uh, we do anticipate having early and late types of practices for both winter and spring sports. But again, as we continue to walk through this experience of the COVID pandemic, we'll see you know, what is transpiring with our winter and spring sports when we get to that point in time of the year. Another important part is about when an athlete and or parents want to have a conversation with a coach. The timing of that conversation is important, and I do ask and expect that that not be occurring immediately after a game. A coach has many expectations that I set forth along with our press, our media, and any of the other obligations that go with this. So it's important that these types of conversations are not occurring right after a game, but instead let 24 hours then uh, go by and then make contact with the coach to sit down and have those conversations. I'm gonna go back to one more piece here with expectations for everyone and it has to do with sportsmanship. From time to time there are situations at home and away, away events where the conduct of a player, a coach, or spectators, whether that be fellow students or other parents, uh, relatives, or guests in the stands do not conduct themselves with the ideals of sportsmanship and what should be happening at high school sports. Whether it be an official's call, whether it be a mistake by a player, may it, it's a reaction by a coach, all of these should be representing the highest ideals of sportsmanship at these types of competitions. So think about your word choice, think about your reaction. We are going to the games and we want to be present at these events to support our student athletes. And there's gonna be times when our opponent makes an amazing play, then accept that for what it is. They had an amazing display and we're successful with that. Cheer on our team so that they are putting their best efforts out and let's show the respect at the highest level for our student athletes of both teams, along with our officials. Officials are individuals who have the love of support for, these, for the games, and they are officiating because they want to see our student athletes excel, all right? They are making quick, spur the moment decisions as far as what they are seeing. And many times their angle at the court and where they are gives them a completely different vantage point and view than what we may be seeing from the bleachers or on the end of the gym. So let's again show levels of high respect and high sportsmanship no matter what the circumstances are, whether that's occurring on our football fields, our soccer fields, out at a cross country race, matches for volleyball, games for basketball in the gym, in the spring on the softball and baseball diamonds, it doesn't matter. Great sportsmanship should be occurring in all of these locations. Some additional information, high school students, um, have opportunities to order letter jackets. I anticipate setting dates again in October and February because those uh, dates of orders usually fall nice that uh, with the Christmas holiday that that letter jacket can be used as a holiday gift. Um, students should be watching for signs and information on announcements and posters hanging up around the school and also we will put this on our website uh, so that parents would be informed as well. Season passes. 
I've listed all of the same information from previous years. However, at this point in time, we do not know what season passes or even attendance by spectators at games will be. We are moving forward in the state of this pandemic to try to provide practices and competition opportunities for our student athletes so they don't miss out on these opportunities. But we also have to be very realistic in what the number of spectators are and if spectators are allowed at events. Our Trailways Conference and many of our non-conference games, they cover many, many different counties where we travel. Within our own Trailways Conference, I believe we are uh, represented by seven different counties. So whether or not spectators could be present at a game is gonna be determined by the Department of Health within each one of those counties. So at this time, I anticipate weekly information going out to families and being shared by coaches with the athletes so that they know with once we start hopefully being competing in games, whether spectators are allowed to be there or not, and it may be just parents only in some states instances when we have to limit numbers. What I do know as a conference that we've talked about is that for any of our competition events, face coverings will be required and that is to keep everyone safe. And we are also expecting the social distancing while we are at the games as well. A little bit of additional information, it talks about some dual participation here. Um, Dodgeland is a member of the WIAA. Our middle school is not an official member, but we follow the same rules with one exception. It has to do with dual participation because often we have a club, a school, or a rec department activity that has some overlap. Many of our seasons, are separated, but we end up having some overlap. And if we did not allow some dual participation, then either school programs wouldn't be able to uh, stay in existence or our recreation or our club type of activities. The best example I can give is the middle school boys basketball starts the mid to late October and goes through early December. And early December is when the Recreation Department basketball is starting. Just the uh, flip happens for our girls basketball. They do their uh, season in the fall and are wrapping it up usually before Christmas break, but then that's right before our winter break when we start our school girls basketball practices. And the last example would be the youth wrestling club and middle school students that are participating in our middle school wrestling program. Regarding competitions and amateur status, it is really important for our student athletes, this is both middle school and high school, to understand that when they have committed themselves to the current season of a school sport, then they may not participate in other similar activities outside in a um, otherwise recreation or fun run competition type of event. Uh, examples that I've shared here are cross country and fun runs, football season and the punt pass and kick competitions, or during the basketball seasons when different types of free throw contests are taking place. The safest way is for a student athlete or parent to contact me so that I can review what is that event and would it violate an amateur status situation for any student athlete. We have contracted athletic training services again through our same provider. Many of you are aware that the Beaver Dam Community Hospital is now the Marshfield Clinic. It's the Beaver Dam location. Wendy Sheb will be returning as our licensed athletic trainer. The information provided here, her email address and her phone number, 
We ask that if need be, pause this meeting right now or take your phone and take a picture of this and keep it in your picture uh, gallery so that should you need to get ahead, uh, get a hold of Wendy um, and due to an injury that your child has sustained, you can be calling or texting her any time of day, getting a hold of her wherever you're at. When you leave a message, please include your name, the name of the student athlete, what kind of injury that they have, and what number is the best one to be reaching you at. We will also provide this information to our student athletes, and we'll get that sent out on their iPads so that they keep this close in contact, and it's also always posted on our athletic training door as well. Regarding when is Wendy here, she will be here on Mondays and Thursdays. She will be here uh, right before the end of our day and also uh, up to 4.30. The place to see her is in the athletic training room, which is up in the mezzanine, and she is here to evaluate injuries that also could be happening during practices or games. We do have a sign-up sheet that has been used in the office. We are still working through the plan with how to create that sign-up list to be seeing Wendy. Um, if an injury occurs on a Monday night game or a Tuesday night game, and it's something that really needs to be seen right away rather than waiting till her Thursday visit, parents can contact me, a student athlete can contact me, and then I will get a hold of Wendy to see if we could have uh, her do a modified visit here at school sooner rather than waiting, all right? Wendy will work closely with your physician should you choose to take your uh, child to your uh, primary care provider, and that is perfectly fine. We support that as well. We just also want to provide the uh, licensed athletic training services right here at school so we can work with that athlete and their doctor, continue on a treatment plan or a rehab program from uh, a significant injury because our goal is to get them back on the playing court or on the playing field to be able to resume their activity as safely as they can. If you do go to your own doctor, it would be important for you to also bring a note back that the doctor has seen them, what the determination of the injury is, and that the uh, athletic trainer should be continuing to assess and work with that athlete. Athletic trainer services are provided at all levels of our football game, and Wendy will also be present for all of our home games for all of our varsity sports. She gives us the following recommendations regarding injuries. Anytime there is an injury, it is important to ice right away and elevate. Do not use any heat on an acute or a sudden injury unless you've been instructed otherwise. It could cause more injury and more swelling instead. If it is a medical emergency, we should be calling 911 to get additional medical uh, attention to help and support that injury. All right. We want to alert and keep Wendy in uh, up to date with good communication. So again, text or email her. And once again, a reminder, bring a note from your doctor for the athletic trainer to continue injury care. We spent some time earlier in this meeting talking about concussions. So if you suspect your student athlete has sustained a concussion, concussion please notify that athletic trainer as soon as possible. Um, if you are, again, going to your doctor to get an assessment or to urgent care or emergency room, that is perfectly fine. We encourage that. It's now we want the collaboration and the teamwork together uh, between all of our specials uh, in helping that student athlete then get back on the road of recovery and returning to the court. Dodgeln is blessed to have an active and supportive athletic booster club. The Dodgeln Athletic Booster Club meets monthly on the second Wednesdays of each month at 6.30. Uh, we will be resuming our meetings here in the Dodgeland School Commons in August. They 
provide a variety of fundraisers and events throughout the year, and these events need help and support of our uh, parents and community members to help uh, continue the support of our Dodgeland Athletic Programs. Throughout the years, there has been the purchase of jerseys and equipments for all kinds of our sports programs, and in order to keep this uh, active program going, we need everyone's support. If you have any questions, you will see the officers listed below, and you may contact any of them. They also are on our school website as well. They uh, have a tab that is directly under all the sports that I had shown earlier in this presentation. So a thank you to the Dodgeland Athletic Booster Club for their continued support of Dodgeland Athletics. Before I get to the thank you with parents, I do want to touch on the start of our sports seasons. Many of you are aware that the WIAA Board of Control held a meeting last Thursday morning. It was a three-hour meeting that was uh, provided to uh, people to watch uh, via the internet. It was regarding the situation with the pan, uh, the COVID pandemic and what do we do with fall sports because there were some uh, proposals and recommendations to be moving fall sports to the spring, springs to summer, and adjust winter. And it was decided, decided by the WIAA Board of Control to redesignate start dates for our fall programs. So the following dates are the new start dates for our programs. The only sport that is starting as originally scheduled that Dodgeland currently offers would be cross country. Cross country for both high school and middle school will be able to continue to start on August 17th. Cross country always starts with an eight o'clock check-in with the coaches at the Wild Goose Park Shelter. So you can plan right now for an 8 o'clock practice to be starting on August 17th with more information coming from the cross-country coaches. Our other fall sports of football, volleyball, and high school boys soccer will not be starting until the new start date approved by the Board of Control, which is September 7th. September 7th is Labor Day. It is a Monday. Coaches may be starting practice that day on the 7th. However, practices would be late afternoon or early evening. More information will be distributed to the parents and the athletes. If they decide to wait till Tuesday, September 8th, that will be fine. But understand the WIAA requirement is of a specific number of practices that must be uh, uh, participated in for a student athlete and or <coughs> team to be able to compete. So there is a lot more information to come out to you as families and student athletes. As I mentioned earlier in this meeting, we have conferences and athletic directors and schools that we're meeting with all of this rescheduling of events. So there is much more that's going to be coming forward with our schedules and our events and explaining how um, schedules are going to be revamped. Um, we thank you in advance for your cooperation with this uh, situation. Our goal is to get our student athletes safely back into practices and back into competition. And we know that that might create some new norms then for everyone to follow but this is essential so that we can keep everyone safe and still allow our games to continue. Coming back to my final thank you here for the parents. Thank you for logging on here tonight and for encouraging your child to participate in athletics. We know that your commitments are going to be many and daily throughout the seasons and throughout the whole school year if your child is participating in multiple sports because you're providing transportation to and from practices. Um, you're going to all of the activities in many cases. Sometimes you're helping prepare late meals for your family after the games. 
Um, I do not foresee any team type of dinners being permitted this year with the COVID situation. And I thank you for your understanding with that, but thank you for your ongoing support for not only your child who's out on the court, but for their teammates, for our Dodgeland coaches, and also for our officials who are out on those courts and fields providing the, the competition opportunity for them. If you have questions, again, please send an email to me so that I can address those and I will be putting those on the website. Parents, please continue to watch emails, text messages. I recommend that you continue to check every couple of days on our school website as more information and more decisions come forward. This, the means of social media is also what we would use should our county status change and that creates any impact on the start dates um, other than what I just identified, August 17th for cross country and September 7th for football, volleyball, and boys soccer. Thank you much. Good luck to our Dodgeland Trojan athletes throughout this entire year. And I look forward to working with all the students and parents in the Dodgeland district. Thank you for watching the 2021 Dodgeland Virtual Sports Meeting. Each family must now complete a Google form to verify that they have completed the requirement of watching this meeting. Please go to the Dodgeland Athletic website as I described earlier. You can click by either going into the high school or middle school athletic site and you want to go to where the meeting is listed and you want to click on the uh, link that's titled Verification of Meeting. Parents and student athletes should complete this form together and you may go back to the video if needed to answer any of the questions.